How do you know if you're living in a free society? Here's a quick test. Are you allowed to say obviously true things in public, or are you forced to lie? As George Orwell put it in 1984, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. But what if that freedom isn't granted? What if you're required to repeat things you know aren't true? What if everyone who hears you knows perfectly well that you're lying, but can't say so out loud? What if everyone is required instead to nod along and mock sincerity as if it's all completely real? That's what a pep rally in a police state looks like. Thanks to the dear leader for a bountiful potato harvest, they chant, even as they starve to death. You get the same feeling as you watch the current race for the Democratic nomination. Pete Buttigieg is in that race. A few years ago, back when he was best known for being mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Buttigieg made the point that all lives matter. He said it because it's true. All lives do matter, no matter what they look like. Every life has value, period. That's the message of Christianity and of the civilization that it spawned in the West. But in the modern Democratic Party, that can no longer be acknowledged. So Buttigieg apologized for his wrong think. 2015, yeah. you said that all lives matter when you spoke um, about two police controversies that were happening in South Bend. Was that a mistake? What I did not understand at that time was that that phrase, just early into mid, especially 2015, was coming to be viewed as a sort of counter slogan to Black Lives Matter. Uh, and so the, this statement that seems very anodyne and, and something that, that's kind of nobody could be against actually wound up being used to devalue uh, what the Black Lives Matter movement was telling us. Since learning about how that phrase was being used to push back on that activism, I stopped using it in that context. I'm sorry I said all lives matter. I won't say that again. Going forward, only some lives will matter. Whatever lives the party deems meaningful, I am penitent and I stand corrected. The crowd nodded gravely. We are pleased to see your turn of heart, comrade. Well, at least Buttigieg managed to preserve some dignity as he went through the motions of his ritual apology. Beto O'Rourke, who is 46 years old and still skateboards, has no dignity. When asked about a harmless joke he once told about his wife staying home to raise the kids, O'Rourke fell apart completely. He groveled and whimpered and abased himself. He even expanded the self-criticism and apologized for how he was born. Constructive criticism. It, it, it has already made me a better candidate. Not only will I not say that again, uh, but, but I'll be much more thoughtful going forward in, in the way that um, I talk about our marriage and also the way in which I acknowledge the truth of the criticism that I have enjoyed white privilege. Absolutely. Undeniable. This is what Maoist tribunals look like during the Cultural Revolution. By summer, you can picture Beto wearing a paper dunce cap with white privilege scrawled across it in red letters as a warning to other would-be counter-revolutionaries. Pretty much everyone running for president as a Democrat this year has had to face inquisitions like this. They write their confessions of guilt, bowing before their accusers on social media and begging for forgiveness. Kirsten Gillibrand read her confession on live television. Years ago, when she was running for a different office, Gillibrand once expressed sympathy for the idea of a border. Looking back, she is deeply ashamed. She can hardly believe she ever thought something so immoral. You essentially said that you were embarrassed about your previous position yeah. on immigration. Tell me about that. Well, I don't think it was um, driven from my heart. I was callous to the suffering of families who want to be with their loved ones, people who want to be reunited with their families. And I recognize, as we all do, that immigration and diversity is our strength as a country. I really regretted that I didn't look beyond my district and talk about why this is an important part of the United States story. Diversity is our strength, she says. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Diversity is our strength. This is the new Nicene Creed. Don't ask what it means. That's not your place. Just mouth the words. Well, there's nothing liberal about any of this, obviously. It is purely authoritarian, woke fascism. Power over ideas in place of thinking, obedience. In return for dissent, punishment. Lying as an official policy. And not just conventional lying, the ordinary truth shading of everyday life, but terrifying full inversion lies, the exact opposite of the truth. The kind of lies that regimes that seek total control must tell in order to maintain their power. The latest of these lies is that low-grade mafia figure Al Sharpton is, in fact, a legitimate civil rights leader. 
All of the Democratic candidates claim to believe that now. This week, they trooped over to his extremely tax-exempt organization to pretend he's the new MLK. I know that Reverend Sharpton takes this platform seriously. This is not the place for talk. This is the place for action. People like Reverend Sharpton, who has never stopped fighting for social justice. Well, thank you so much, Reverend. Thank you. Thank you for your wisdom and your witness, your work. And expressing my deep appreciation uh, to you, Reverend Al, for everything that you've done, not just in organizing this conference, but more importantly, over the years, to make sure that this country can live up to the words and its founding documents and then go beyond. Oh, the Reverend Sharpton fighting for social justice. Where were these people in the mid-1990s when Al Sharpton was denouncing a Jewish landlord in Harlem as a, quote, white interloper just before his store was firebombed and eight people were killed? Well, Beto was still a manny then. Christian Gillibrand was a lawyer working for the cigarette companies. None of them were woke yet. They are now. Watch them clamor for an idea that not 20% of the American population supports, race-based reparations. Uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has proposed a bill to form a commission to study how to do reparations. When I am elected president, I'll sign it. Would you sign that bill? Yes. Yes, would you sign it? The House and Senate passed that bill, of course I would sign it. I firmly support Congresswoman Jackson Lee's bill to create a commission to study reparations. Would you sign the bill for reparations? Yes, I would. I already support that bill. There are things that we need to do in this country that have been a long time in coming. One of those is to move forward with reparations. Well, it's like an altar call. In fact, it is an altar call, the modern version. But the bigger question isn't, will we get reparations in this country? The real question is, do you want to live in a place where people like the ones you just saw on the screen have more political power, where humor and dissent are criminal acts, where lying is the currency of public life, where authorities whose names you don't know can destroy you for thinking the wrong things? You're familiar with that world. You've seen it before. It's called Twitter. Imagine if it had control of the U.S. military. Jason Hill is a professor of philosophy at DePaul University and the author of the book, We Have Overcome, and he joins us tonight. Professor, thanks very much for coming on. So define for us, if you would, what it means to be woke. Everyone we just played on the screen, I think, would describe him or herself as woke. It's a, it's a certain brand of political philosophy right now. What is it? It is a form of moral bullying, I think, in terms of coercing people into a kind of consensus around what constitutes injustice when what constitutes a concept of injustice might be open to moral debate. And it's a way of shutting down debate, really, uh, by invoking a non-concept. Woke is really a non-concept. It really doesn't stand for anything. I think when individual rights are violated, we have a right as a, a moral society to say that individual rights have been violated in this area. But the concept of a woke culture is really a bullying movement to shut down free debate, to shut down dissent, when so-called received wisdom by members of probably the very, very far left um, have been challenged on their viewpoints. What I'm so struck by, I mean, there have always been forces, totalitarian forces in this in every society, but, but quickly I'm wondering, why is nobody in power in that party standing up against them. The preference for uh, pandering to people's feelings and pandering to people's emotions takes precedence, take precedence yes. over the truth. 